Hi, you are listening to Scribble Talk Teaching, a podcast for bid and proposal professionals. My name is Bhaskar Sundram and I'll be sitting down with our industry veterans to dive deep into the topics that business winning professionals like you and me can use to help grow our skills and our business. Today's guest is Eric Gregory. What many people don't know was Eric is the very first guest we interviewed for Scribble Talk. It's, uh, but it launched as episode number four. Please do go and listen to episode four. Eric is a veteran of the industry, so I'm not going to give much introduction to Eric, and I'm going straight into the talk. This talk is about the paradoxes in the business development function. So Eric has kindly written an article about it, which will be given part of this overall podcast. But on this talk, as we know, it's conversation based. So first of all, welcome Eric to Scribble Talk Teaching. Yeah, I'm um, I'm sorry, Basker. I, I I didn't quite catch that last piece. I just said welcome to Scribble Talk. Oh, yeah. okay. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> Always glad to be here to be able to you know talk about some interesting things. Definitely, and we also have Neil with us. The Levid uh, will also be joining me just as a. Just don't just be uh, just uh, an additional guest to just uh, go through in this journey. So welcome, Neil, to Scribble Talk as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's start the conversation, uh, Eric. Why is this paradox is important? Why do you think this paradoxes exist before we even get into the 10 paradoxes? Well, I think it's it's the human mind. You know, as we as we well know, it's a very complex uh, complex entity. Uh, and I think what happens is it's a part of the thinking process, and why paradoxes become important because we have a tendency, because of our uh, overabundant intellectual capability, uh, to overcomplicate things. Uh, and when we begin overcomplicating things, we begin to uh, create confusion in terms of how we should proceed in terms of solving a problem. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's where paradoxes come in because paradoxes have a tendency to, you know, present, you know, uh, you know, a, a complex and a simple solution. And almost all the time we have a tendency to select a more complex solution in order to move forward. Uh, and that's usually the wrong thing to do. And people, you know, always have difficulty, uh, not only in business and not only in proposals, but in life in general, uh, in terms of really coming to grips with this idea uh, that we very often should be selecting the simpler solution uh, to a problem to make progress. Uh, And so I see it all the time in industry uh, where selecting the wrong answer as it relates to a paradox Uh, really leads uh, individuals and businesses uh, into problems that they could have avoided by having some awareness uh, that these paradoxes do in fact exist. uh, Mm -hmm. And and one of our responsibilities is to understand that, uh, to make sure that we're making effective decisions based on our knowledge that paradoxes do exist uh, and ensuring that we can achieve the growth potential uh, personally, uh, you know, from a business perspective, and then, of course, from a capture and proposal perspective by managing these paradoxes appropriately. Well said, well said, uh, Eric. I mean, like, what, a, what an important message to start with. We have a tendency to select complex solutions to simple problems. You know, you're right. Um, literally, I, I wrote that myself because I, that's exactly what I was doing today morning. <laughs> trying to overcook things, but that's brilliant. So for 45, 50 years of experience, Eric, and not in just in our industry, plus you know, a lot more experiences in life, let's just focus on um, just on bids, uh, bids and proposals, capture business development uh, for now. And let's just go through uh, the 10 paradoxes that you have listed. And I'm sure during the conversation, we'll find more. The very first thing that you mentioned uh, listed was bid less, win more. So let's talk us through, Eric. Well, it's a, you know, it's one that should be obvious to anybody in the business. 
Uh, and yet it's one that most organizations violate in such a way that when somebody like me comes in to kind of take a look at the problems you're having, the first thing that I've I discover is that you're simply bidding way more than you should in order to achieve your objectives. And when we have a tendency to bid more than we should to achieve our objectives, we lose focus. And we wonder then why our win rates and capture ratios aren't what they need to be. And it's because we have resources spread way too thin over opportunities that we have a very low probability of winning. And so it's just axiomatic uh, in this industry that, that if you focus on those things that you can, where you have absolutely a reasonable probability of win based on capability and credibility, you are going to bid less than you would otherwise. And you will in fact improve your win rates and your capture ratios simply by the focus that that drives into your discipline to be able to use your resources wisely and effectively to accomplish your business objectives. It, it, it's so simple uh, that it, it defies logic as to why businesses continuously bid more than they should and then wonder why their win rates and capture ratios aren't as they should be and why they're not achieving their new business objectives. I mean, it's just unimaginable that this should persist the way it does, but it infects every business uh, if, if we're not careful. As you rightly said, it's a very simple thing and we all uh, have this objective, Eric, but what's stopping them? What's stopping people from doing this, uh, Eric? Because one interesting thing that, that we did, we did a study just last year, just uh, talking to a few veterans and also reviewing the proposals that was done in, say, late 1990s, early 2000, and compared to the quality of proposals that was done, say, 2018-19. Um, you know, looking at it, what we found out was, as you rightly said, the quality of proposals were much, much higher a few years ago or you know, or like a few decades ago compared to what's it today? Is it because of the new way of uh, you know doing more for less because of proposal automation and stuff? So we churn a lot more thinking, you know, let's bid 10, we are going to win one anyway. What what do you think is happening today, Eric, around this? Well, I'm, it, it, it relates to exactly what I'm talking about here with the bid less and win more concept. You know, the paradox, the paradox that in, involves, and uh, as you said, with proposal automation, is we have a tendency to believe that we can do more and more effectively through automation uh, and through using these various tools. And that's not the right answer. What happens with that is we get deceived. We get deceived by the fact that we have these tools that we think can in increase input and what we forget that the creation of a superior proposal is a thinking process. And we cannot substitute automation for thinking. And that's what people have a tendency to do. And so we wash away the thinking part of it, thinking that automation is actually going to help us create a better proposal. And no, what it actually does is it decreases the amount of thinking that goes into the proposal. And we end up with proposals that are less effective you know, lower probabilities of win. And then we're surprised when that happens because we don't understand the relationship between thinking and high quality proposals. People always want the easy answer. And guess what? There's no easy answer to any of this stuff. It's hard work. It requires a lot of thought. And most people don't want to think. Wow. Uh, 100% Eric. Do you also think uh, the personality of uh, or the culture of a company also gets into this? Oh, absolutely. I mean, uh, culture is absolutely critical to success uh, when it comes to business. Uh, and what happens in certain uh, organizations is the culture is not built around uh, the concept of thinking. Uh, we sometimes believe that it is, uh, but it's not. Um, the culture is built around the concept of 
I want to achieve great things, but I don't necessarily want to make the investment in order to achieve those great things, which includes investment in thinking. And thinking takes time. Uh, thinking takes money. Thinking takes effort. Thinking requires other resources in order to be effective. And a lot of organizations don't want to do that. They simply want to be able to, again, use the minimal amount of resources to achieve the greatest level uh, of, of revenue and profit. And it simply doesn't work that way. Everybody wants to take the easy way out uh, instead of just doing the hard work uh, that is required in order to be successful. And I see it all the time. Uh, and it's just amazing to me uh, that uh, the companies, again, fall into this trap uh, and can't understand why they're not accomplishing the things that they should be accomplishing uh, because of the talent they actually have available to them to do the work. Uh, that's, that's classic, uh, Eric. And, but as you also said in Paradox 2, strategic thinkers kill proposal efforts. So let's talk about that. And then we'll go to a balance of the thinking in the proposal efforts. Let's talk about why strategic thinkers kill proposal efforts, Eric. Well, because you know there comes a time in a proposal where you have to have a baseline solution. Mm -hmm. And the problem with strategic thinkers uh, is they can't stop thinking. Uh, and so we have to get out of them, all the good things that we can possibly get early on in the process. And then we have to cut them off because if we allow them to, you know, stay involved in the process from that strategic level, we never get a baseline solution that we can actually propose to. The strategic thinkers always want to drive perfection and they will be at, you know, post red team still trying to perfect the solution well past the time that we can afford to be able to do that and actually create a superior proposal. So if you keep them involved too long, I can guarantee you, you're going to end up with an inferior proposal because you will have constant changes all the way to the end of uh, the proposal effort. And so consequently will not submit, you know, a good solid uh, technical business management or pricing baseline uh, that a customer will be able to understand uh, and be able to then score uh, highly because it, uh, they won't be able to figure out really what the answer to your question uh, was because you never arrived on a baseline solution to present to them. It just constantly changed. Uh, and so we've got to get these folks out, out of the process early in order to be effective. Uh, that's another important point, Eric. But at what point do we then bring these thinkers to the governance and the reviews that we have? And uh, do we think we need to have a kind of uh, a barrier uh, for them or at least give them a criteria about what they should do, what they shouldn't do? Well, I think it's, you know, it's, it's very clear that in terms of being most effective uh, that we, we need to achieve you know, that solution baseline freeze not too long after we receive a solicitation. Uh, and that's when they need to be eliminated. Now, it doesn't mean uh, that we don't necessarily want to use them in a color team review process, uh, but we do have to bound them in terms of here's the deal. You know, we're now not into the solutioning part, we're into the messaging part. And so your job shifts from defining the solution to making sure that we are presenting the facts and data that are going to help us win in the most appropriate way and the way that's going to support our contention as to why we should be selected to do the work. Uh, and that's a shift in thinking that's absolutely critical in the process. And again, not only do I find that strategic thinkers have difficulty making that shift, I find it that I find that companies in general you know, have a problem making that shift going from basically defining the solution to proof. Because at the end of the day, it's the facts and data that you drive into the proposal based on your solution that ultimately are going to increase your probability of win by having the key and the right messages in that proposal supported by proof. 
uh, and that makes a huge difference in why we should be selected on anything that we choose to bid. That's a good one. Do you have any instances of this going wrong completely and uh, your way of, you know, then bringing it back to uh, to the right path? Any, any, any example comes to your mind? Well, I don't know of any specific example in terms. I mean, I've worked a number of, you know, uh, efforts over the course of my career uh, where, you know, I've, I've run into these kinds of issues. Uh, and the interesting thing is when you run into a proposal or a capture uh, or a program that's that's in that's in trouble and you need to uh, and you need to try and get it back under the con under control. Uh, again, this is another paradox uh, that gets involved is the first thing you need to do is to, you know, is to cut the size of the team uh, down to a size that's very manageable with people who are. Uh, able to listen, follow directions, and do what you need them to do, and do it swiftly, accurately, and effectively. Uh, and so that uh, my my fundamental example is if you find yourself, you know, in a situation where things are not going particularly well, uh, that's one of the things that you need to do is is to make sure that you cut the size of the team, uh, and make sure that you have somebody in charge. Uh, who can actually get them focused very quickly on the things that are going to make a huge difference. Uh, we have a tendency still uh, in business and on proposals uh, to confuse activity uh, with effectiveness. Uh, and activity does not equal effectiveness. Uh, we cannot have people, you know, just doing things that aren't going to contribute significantly to probability of win on any particular effort. Uh, and if they aren't doing the right things, we need to get them off the off the job. So, so Eric, when I hear you th talking about these things, I go back to what you mentioned at the very onset of, of your conversation about moving to simplicity. All of these items that you're talking about have an element of focus. And uh, I'd love to hear you comment on whether you think any of the blockages or things that prevent people from doing this is an element of fear that if I don't add that other person, I'm gonna miss something. If I don't um, add that strategic thinker, um, I'm gonna miss something. If I don't um, bid more, I don't trust my thinking. Um, I'd love to hear you comment on, on those. Yeah, things. I think. I think that's got a lot to do with it. And I think, you know, I, I think part of what we need to do in terms of being able to manage these paradoxes is to drive out that fear. Uh, and fear fundamentally in any situation comes from a lack of understanding. So if you don't understand the paradoxes, of course, your, your, your fear level is going to increase over time uh, because you don't have a belief uh, that you can solve a particular problem with a simple answer. Uh, and I go back, you know, let's, you know, let's go back to the, you know, one of the principles of logic, you know, Occam's razor, you know, which is usually the, the right answer is the simplest answer. Uh, and so we need to stay focused on making sure that we pursue uh, those simple answers that are actually going to lead us forward, uh, as opposed to just, you know, uh, increasing our level of fear and doubt uh, by you know, expanding the number of people that are engaged or involved uh, in all of these activities. Um, it just doesn't work. The, the, you know, the, the more people or the larger size of the team, uh, almost uh, axiomatically, uh, the more problems you're going to have in terms of achieving the right result. Thank you. Nice, Neil. Uh, thank you, Neil. Uh, Eric, that was classic. Uh, Eric, the, the point that you mentioned about smaller teams produce better proposals, can you just talk us through about that as well, Eric? Yeah, it goes back really to what we just kind of had our, our conversation about is that, you know, it, it's really an element, uh, really an element of control. With smaller teams, you have better focus. I mean, again, this is common sense. You have better focus you have better direction, you have better communication, you have better control over activities, you have better insight into what's going on, 
you have less confusion. And so almost by definition, the fact that you're keeping your team small allows you then to create a superior proposal simply because you have better control over what's going on in all aspects of generating and completing that proposal effort. Uh, and so the communication aspect is one of the things that's critical. Smaller teams simply communicate more effectively. And if you go in and you look at problems on, on major efforts, about 90% of those problems can really be traced back to poor communications among the team. So if we can eliminate the number of nodes that have to be communicated with uh, on any particular team, by definition, we are going to have more effective uh, and more efficient communication with a fewer number of nodes that be, need to be communicated with. Uh, again, this is not genius level thinking uh, because I can attest, you know, to anybody that I'm certainly no genius, uh, but I have found over the course of my career that these very simple things can make a huge difference in terms of creating a high quality proposal that will generate more revenue and profit for a company. That's, that's good, Gary. Eric, what do you think from your opinion, a minimum team or a smaller team, who should be comprised in a smaller team? In, in, in terms of, you know, yeah. run that by me one more time, Basker. I'm not sure I really got it. I think in, in, in your opinion, who should be part of a core team? Oh, I got you. Yeah. I, I you know, I, I've, I've seen various, you know, uh, presentations of that. Uh, but in my mind, the core team is, a, is a very, is, is really pretty simple. Uh, and, and, and it's essential to have, you know, these, these folks, number one, you know, uh, of course, is the person who's been leading the business development effort, that person who's had, you know, the main interfaces with the customer who are, who's going to be able to, you know, bring that critical information uh, to the team in terms of what's important to the customer, what are they really trying to achieve, uh, and all that good kind of stuff. So that person is critical. We got to have, we have to have, uh, you know, clearly a, an experienced and capable capture manager or capture team leader or opportunity manager, whatever title you want to give them who actually is responsible for leading uh, the team through all the aspects of increasing probability of win to its maximum. Uh, that's very uh, essential to have that person. Uh, the other person that needs to be right there with them from the beginning almost in terms of the effort is in fact the proposal manager. Uh, the capture manager and the proposal manager fundamentally have to be joined at the hip. Uh, in fact, uh, in almost any organization, if something happens to the capture manager, the proposal manager should really be able to step in and fulfill that role uh, if necessary in order to drive the team uh, forward. And so that you have three right there. You got, you know, the business developer, you got the capture manager, you got the proposal manager. Uh, and then, you know, it's really essential uh, as a part of that team uh, that you have the solution architect or the technical director who's actually going to be responsible then for uh, coming up with that solution uh, to be able to, uh, you know, to have a really good uh, solution that we're going to be able to present to the customer and manage that aspect of it. And then I certainly, as part of my core team, always want the individual who's going to be responsible then for developing the price to win and for developing the pricing architecture that we're really going to have to have and make sure that that pricing architecture is in fact going to conform and be consistent uh, with the technical and business management solution that we're going to offer. Uh, so I that's how I like to have it constituted in, in terms of the small team that's really going to control everything. That's a good one, Erica. Eric, we also have Wolfram Sirene from Shukli Dog uh, in the call. <laughs> hi, Wolfram. Yeah, hi, all together. <laughs> hi, Wolfram, uh, Wolfram you know, Eric was talking about this particular thing about the, uh, the team, the core team. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, how does it apply in Germany? 
That's a very good point. I thought about that. I mean, uh, uh, I think Greg was still talking about a lot of people. And uh, I think in, in many tenders or, or it's a uh, capture work, you don't have so many people. So sometimes it boils down to perhaps uh, three people and some support. Mm. Yeah, so it's, uh, and, and of course, then really um, everybody knows each other and everybody is responsible for the whole. And I, I agree, sometimes it's better to have a smaller team than a bigger team, you know, and it's better to throw out those people which do not, how can I say, bring in any uh, benefits. Mm. Yeah. And only allow people you call in, into a meeting, you know, and the other ones uh, can go. So, yeah, definitely a, a very practical approach to make sure you have the right team size. Yes. Uh, I, yeah, yeah. Yes, so thank you, Wolfram. Again, Eric, that's a beautiful point because uh, the, the word capture manager is something that's now gradually ticking along on, on outside US. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you, it is. You know, even UK, for example, you know, it's like uh, now I, I, I can vouch for UK and to a certain extent India, for example, it's sales director or what they call the deal, deal lead or something. Um, and then you have the proposal manager, then you have the, the technical person and you, and, and, and you call estimator or pricing guys. So it's, it's fascinating to just see how capture is so embedded in the States and going forward. I hope uh, that there is a clear cut definition between what's the salesperson does or the marketing or the BD person does, capture person does and the proposal person does. I think that demarcation is going to be super important and it will be very interesting how their whole team evolves as they grow, I think. Yeah, I mean, it, I mean, I can can add here perhaps. I mean, and this is all just roles. I mean, quite often the the uh, sales guy, he is he is sometimes you know the capture manager, of course, and most likely he is the capture manager because he is the one driving his business, you know. But it depends on how big the opportunity is. You may select you know somebody else for the capture part. Mm -hmm. So uh, you know, it's not so well known in Germany. You know, but it's known by international companies which are working international in defense, in in uh, in how can I say in the mobility rail industry, all the big stuff. They they are very much uh, using you now English and, and uh, American terms, Quite but true. but the vast majority is is German. I know uh, you know I, I can't talk about capture manager. No, they will look to me and. Uh, uh, saying uh, well, what you're talking about. We have a we have a Vertriebsmann. So we have a salesperson. <laughs> yeah. And there's so, not and there's not necessarily anything wrong with combining those roles, but if you're going to combine those roles, you know, it's essential whatever you call that individual, it's mm -hmm. essential that they both have good sales capability and good capture management execution capability if in fact you are going to combine uh, those roles and there are people who can do that uh, mm -hmm. and there are of course some people who cannot do that uh, yep. if you're going to combine the roles it's just a matter of making sure that you have the person who actually has the ability to execute both of those roles in a way that's going to increase probability of win yeah i think in general the uh, german companies may spend less effort and money uh, in, in this road. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So they, they, they may look more into the proposal and technology area. Uh, and of course, sales guys are, I know, of course, important, but they are, they call it sales people, you know? I mean, um, it, it's a, uh, and there are different levels of responsibility. So, um, but I agree, I mean, here, uh, Eric, uh, that uh, it depends on the capability and the, how can I say, the horizon a sales guy has, <laughs> you know, so sometimes he's uh, too simple. That takes us to the, to the next paradox, Eric, which says to gain control, you have to give up control. Um, a smaller team, um, you know, it's good we can have some control of who does what, but larger team we don't. Talk us through also about the paradox, Eric, please. Well, it's a classic issue of delegation. I, I see way too many opportunities uh, fail because uh, the capture manager or the proposal manager 
uh, is unwilling to delegate uh, responsibility uh, to uh, members of the team uh, that they really have to rely on to actually uh, get things done. We can't all do everything. Um, and even though we want to, sometimes we do in fact have to make sure uh, that we are delegate, de delegating and holding people accountable for the things that uh, have been delegated uh, to them. Uh, and I just see it way too many times in industry. I see it in business in general, uh, is that we fail to delegate, set expectations, define accountability, and then we try and do everything ourselves. And of course, that has a tendency to lead to failure. Uh, that's one of the classic things in terms of entrepreneurship, in terms of why, uh, why it, companies get to the point where you have to fire the founder, uh, because the founder typically never really learned to delegate and to trust uh, other people uh, on the team to be, to, you know, to accomplish those things that are going to make the business uh, ultimately more successful. Uh, and so we just have to recognize that we have to have a frame of mind that allows us to delegate uh, important actions to people, but also to make sure that we are in fact setting expectations accordingly and holding them accountable for the things that we have delegated to them to do. Uh, it's a very hard thing for people to to you know, really to accomplish that, uh, but it's something we have to learn if we're going to be successful. That's a nice point, Eric. Eric, as, as you know, unfortunately, in our industry, not everybody will progress from being proposal manager into like an executive leader, right? So, and that's one of the reasons some people tend to hold what they have and not delegate, etc. What advice would you give them, Eric? Well, it's pretty simple advice. If, if you don't learn to delegate, uh, you're going to fail. And then you're eventually, uh, after a number of failures, you're going to be asked to go work for the competitors. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, um, you know, we really all of us uh, have to learn to do that. And we demonstrate strength uh, by really uh, learning to uh, delegate uh, so that we can accomplish more and use our expertise in a better way. And not only that, uh, we have to learn to delegate because we have a generation that's going to follow us uh, that we're going to look to to be able to carry the, our successes into the future. Uh, mm -hmm. And if we don't delegate, we're failing our training responsibilities to the organization in terms of training that next generation to be as effective or more effective uh, than we were in terms of the roles that we were fulfilling at that time. Thanks, Eric. And, and, and uh, as you rightly said, it it entirely depends on the leader who's leading the function, the way he delegates. It trickles through the proposals, and the proposal team delegates, and it nice, becomes a nice cohesive team. So we talked up, uh, we talked more about uh, proposals and some element of process. Now let's talk about the timelines as well, Eric. I think one of the paradoxes which you highlighted was the shorter the time to react, the greater the need to plan in detail. So uh, let's talk about that, Eric. Yeah, I mean, it, there's there's several of these that relate in, in terms of that, uh, you know, in terms of time is that, uh, you know, the first, the first aspect is getting to the solution, which we know is going to take a lot of time. Uh, and what happens is we never allow enough time to get to that baseline solution, which then causes all sorts of problems, uh, you know, downstream uh, from that inability to get a baseline freeze. Uh, and so we've really got to pay attention to that uh, and make sure uh, that we do, in fact, allow a significant amount of time to come up with a solution, freeze that solution. Uh, and then we can have a well-developed and proposal that has a high probability win. So time management here is critical. Uh, and then, you know, kind of in that next part, uh, which is, you know, the, sh you know, the shorter the proposal period, the longer the kickoff meeting, that detailed planning uh, is absolutely critical. And I always hear, uh, you know, people say when, it, when we don't have much time is, well, we don't have time to have a long kickoff meeting or we don't have time, you know, to do the detailed planning. Well, you have to do the detailed planning up time up front when you don't have much time because you have no recovery period. On an effort where there's uh, more time available, 
overall, if something goes wrong, the recovery on that is generally pretty easy. We have to take a little time, but we know we have time to recover from anything that might go wrong or that doesn't get executed perfectly. And when you have a shorter amount of time, that's the difference. There is no recovery time, zero. And so everything needs to be planned out accordingly. It needs to be choreographed accordingly. It needs to be executed accordingly because there is no recovery if we don't make a schedule. If we make a schedule with an inferior product, we're just going to have to roll with it and move forward because we simply do not have the time you know, to do anything different. And that's why that upfront planning is even more important on a shorter proposal period than a longer proposal period. And I, and I just don't understand why folks can't seem to understand that concept. Uh, but I'm telling you, you know, my experience is they don't. Uh, and so consequently, uh, when they get into these shorter proposal period times, uh, folks just kind of want to just start with abandon uh, and create a lot of motion, but it's very ineffective motion. And then they end up with a, an inferior proposal at the end of the process. Totally, totally. And Neil or Wolfram, uh, do you have any thoughts around how this seems to be mainly a, a, a continuous issue? Yeah, I mean, uh, when I'm teaching this stuff or I'm working with a customer, I mean, and most of the mistakes uh, in, in big or small project is always that the solution is not clear at the beginning. Mm. Yeah, and I think this is a very, very important topic. Yeah, and, and this needs to be fixed first. Then everybody can work, you know, uh, on, on this proposal. Yeah, and uh, but I saw other live projects where due to some external issues at, at the uh, uh, last uh, quarter of the proposal preparation solution uh, need to be changed. And this is a disaster. You know? So you see, it, it's pretty important. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, my, my problem whenever I sit down and listen to Eric is, is that the, uh, the ideas are always so, so brilliant. Uh, my hand starts uh, aching from taking notes. <laughs> yes. I think it's, it's always the common sense that's hard to implement, right? I think we, as Eric pointed out very early on, uh, it's, it's like we are, we, are so, we are so inclined to find complex solutions where we kind of overlook, yes, we know, yes, there is a proposal timeline, yes, we have a team, yes, we have this, and then we make the same mistakes or we kind of then think about that's not the problem and we move on and try to solve a problem that doesn't exist in the first place. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, Eric, let's uh, dwell deeper on this. And again, what that means is, you know, timeline creates different sort of behaviors as well. So, as you write, mentioned, one of the paradoxes is the shorter the proposal period, the longer the kickoff meeting. Um, why do you think that happens? Well, I mean, I, I just, you know, it, just what we talked about. I mean, if if you have if you have less time, and we can't leave anything to chance, mm. uh, and so, for example. On, on a much larger proposal, I may have a kickoff meeting that, that, that might last, you know, a couple of hours because I know on a larger proposal that's going to maybe run over a longer period of time, uh, I'm going to have a lot of daily stand-up meetings where uh, if I need to, you know, uh, in, insert some course corrections or deal with problems, I know I'm going to have time to deal, deal with that. Uh, on a shorter proposal period, I've got one opportunity to make sure that everything is set right, set perfectly, because everybody now has to execute flawlessly in order for me to be able to meet that timeline. And so on a shorter proposal, you know, if I have a 10-day proposal, for example, uh, my, my kickoff meeting uh, might actually be three or four hours, uh, which some people might think is, you know, you know, wildly unimaginable, but everything has to be orchestrated perfectly from the beginning. Uh, because again, there is no recovery time. I'm not going to be able to make a lot of changes that are going to be effective over the course of 10 days. So I have to have everything outlined perfectly at the beginning uh, and set the expectation that everybody's going to execute flawlessly uh, to the schedule over the course of that 10 days 
uh, simply because I do not have time to make alterations. So I need to take that time up front uh, and make sure that everybody understands what it is that they're responsible for, you know, exactly uh, what the, what, when their material is due uh, and make sure if they do in fact run into any problems uh, that I know uh, very quickly uh, because I simply don't have time to be able to do significant alterations on a very short proposal schedule. So you take the time to plan and then you take the time to communicate the plan uh, and that's why the kickoff meeting on a short proposal uh, typically is going to be somewhat longer than a kickoff meeting for, for a longer proposal offer. Mm. Totally, Eric. Eric, uh, the last few pointers on is on presentation graphics and stuff. So uh, uh, I know where people think uh, graphics kinds of solves all the problem, <laughs> but uh, uh, from your opinion, I think one of the paradoxes that you highlighted is technical graphics don't communicate to technical experts. Very profound advice, uh, Eric. Let's just talk it through. Well, because what happens is, you know, when engineer when engineers, you know, want to talk strictly to engineers, uh, you know, they typically don't focus on the message. They typically focus on the engineering detail that they believe is going to convey understanding uh, to another person uh, and. The paradox is that engineering detail may absolutely convey nothing to the other person, a person unless it's supplemented with the right message, which is fundamentally giving them the conclusion that you want them to draw from the information that you're presenting. Uh, and so that's why I say that is that typically what happens is that technical people get all hung up on presenting the detail uh, without presenting the meaning of the detail. Uh, and so we have to make sure that actually what we're presenting in the graphic is the meaning of the detail. And then the detail becomes proof of what we're stating in terms of the meaning. Uh, and unless we do that, uh, you know, we end up with a series of technical graphics and a proposal that communicate fundamentally nothing. Uh, and I actually, you know, had the opportunity really to conduct an experiment one time uh, with a with a client that asked me to develop a little course with them uh, on graphics. And so I said, well, give me some of your proposal graphics uh, that you think are really good and let me kind of build that into the course. Uh, and what I did at the beginning of the course is I put their graphics up and I asked people to tell me what those graphics meant. Uh, and in one instance, I stood there for three minutes absolutely silent while they looked at a graphic that they had created and then finally told me, I don't know. I said, now we know what the problem is. Uh, and what they were doing is they were trying to communicate a lot of engineering detail as opposed to defining the message that they wanted the customer, customer to receive from the information that was being presented. Uh, and so we have to make sure we define the messaging first and then we make sure that we create the graphic that supports the presentation of the facts and data uh, that will enhance that message. It's a simple problem. But again, people don't want to approach this in a simple way. We have this artificial belief uh, that providing, you know, technical evaluators with an immense amount of technical detail is going to aid their understanding. And usually what it simply aids is their confusion. Uh. I think uh, normally the proposal is written for a single user over the evaluator is, uh, without knowing that uh, the evaluator could be an HR person, could be an IT person, could be a, a, an engineer or anybody, but that's uh, that's very interesting, um, Eric. So, Eric, on the other side, you know, on the flip side, sometimes, uh, you know, simple complex, uh, simple concepts yield complex results. Uh, that's another paradox, which you also suggested. How are these two going hand on hand, Eric? Well, I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's one of those things in terms, you know, this idea of simple concepts yielding complex results. I mean, you can have a complex graphic, for example, that you're trying to communicate information with, you know, to a, to an evaluator. And, and the key really is trying to make sure 
uh, that things are partitioned in a way so that folks don't get overwhelmed by the amount of detail. You know, there's a fundamental rule in design in terms of graphics that says the human mind should not have to evaluate any more than five things that are on a particular graphic because they need to do that very quickly and anything over that is just gonna confuse them. But if you go ahead and really try and simplify a visualization of a concept by doing partitioning or demarcation in terms of being able to segment things for the evaluator's mind to absorb information quickly and easily, uh, you can have, you know, again, what are some fairly su simple concepts but are actually yielding complex results in terms of a human's ability to understand something. It, it all comes down to visualization in terms of how you arrange things and present them in a way that aids understanding and then declare, you know, for that evaluator what it is you want them to understand the message that they should have received from the information that you just presented. And if you do that elegantly, uh, it just makes the process of evaluation much easier for the individual that you're presenting this information to. Uh, so there are things that we can do in terms of being able to, you know, display complex information in a way that's going to yield the result that we want, which is a high score for our individual proposal section. Nice, Eric. And um, you know, I know there are a lot more paradoxes uh, that we can go in deeper, Eric. Um, just as a just as a final few thoughts, Eric, and then I leave it to Neil and Wolfram to uh, ask any questions from here. Um, as a final thoughts, you know what, in your opinion, you know, business winning um, versus proposals. What do you think is a paradox there? Well, I think, you know, in terms of the biggest, again, uh, it, it, the biggest paradox I think we have when it relates to, you know, business winning and, and the proposal um, fundamentally, you know, goes along the lines of, you know, staying focused on simplicity. Mm -hmm. uh, and simplicity, you know, really means a, a couple of key things when it comes to, you know, a proposal and, and communication in general. Uh, number one is you've got to understand very clearly what it is that the customer needs and wants. Um, and you have to understand very clearly, you know, what mission is, what mission they're trying to fulfill. And then we need to build our whole proposal effort around what they need, not necessarily what we want or have to sell. Um, the other thing that I think in terms of trying to simplify things is remember, there are only two things an organization has to sell to a customer, only two. And if we can stay focused on those two things, it can make a huge difference. One is capability and the other one is credibility. And if we can stay focused on those, by definition, we're going to create much better proposals than we would otherwise by emphasizing those two things. Thank you, Erika. As you rightly said, you know, there could be hundreds more paradoxes here, but uh, it's important to be aware of these paradoxes. They do exist. You know, we can talk about all the right things to do, but they do exist. And awareness of these paradoxes and maneuvering these paradoxes. Uh, to make a successful bid is of importance. So any last questions to Eric or from Neil from Eric from this talk or any questions that you want to ask Eric? Eric, great, um, great presentation. The one thing I've been thinking about the entire time you have been speaking is that I recently heard a presentation from a source selection authority who said that 85% of the material that they read in a proposal, they don't comprehend. And um, one of the paradoxes I've been thinking about is, is that much of the time um, spent on developing proposal, at least from the technical writers that I work with, is fighting with um, uh, page allocation. And when I look at the things that you've talked about, uh, you know, keeping things simple, simple, making sure that you're communicating um, the important messages and focusing on the things that, that matter, and that so much of the material that we actually do put in our proposals 
aren't even understood by the evaluators that um, if you do these simple yet hard things um, to do, um, you can actually communicate things that need to be communicated in the space available and actually, you know, have proposals that actually win and um, talk about things that need to be talked about. I just think it makes a huge difference. I think that uh, that example that you just gave ought to scare everybody in the proposal business. Uh, because one of the things that we have to fight all the time, I think, is, uh, you know, as proposal managers, or at least frequently, is, you know, putting extraneous, extraneous material in the proposal uh, that we think is going to help build our case. And what we actually discover uh, is that you, the evaluators not only did it not build our case for them, uh, but it actually confused them uh, and they didn't comprehend why a lot of that material was there. I think we have a tendency uh, not to focus on the presentation of facts and data that are going to make a def difference in, in, a, in, uh, in winning and losing. Uh, and over my career, uh, I've discovered that uh, we just aren't particularly good at, number one, defining the facts and data that we need to go into the proposal. Number two, making sure that we have collected the facts and data that we need to go into the proposal. And then number three, uh, presenting those facts and data in a way uh, that's going to be easy for the evaluator to understand and easy for them to receive the messages that we want them to understand with the facts and data that are there to prove you know, the points that we make. And if we can get much more focused on that, I think at the end of the day, all of us will end up having much better proposals than we are currently presenting, and it'll be much easier for the evaluators to understand, and we will see less of this. We couldn't comprehend uh, what was in the proposal. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Any, any last comments from you, Wolfram? No, I just want to, uh, I mean, point number one, a bit less, win more. And, and uh, this is one of the keys with a greater professional, how can I say, uh, content. Mm. I mean, for, for us, of course, it's, it's, uh, we are so long in the industry, it's, it's clear we should do this. But in reality, mm. and, and uh, Eric, many companies are, in, are not working along with those simple, uh, how can I say, gu guidance here. Yeah, there's, uh, on the one hand, is good. So there's a, a, a lot to do for us. On the other hand, you know, it's really a shame, you know, that uh, uh, time and money is wasted for, you know, and and, uh, uh, and one more is perhaps, uh, what can I say? I mean, no options. You know, mm -hmm. you need to know the customer, and you need to offer exactly what what he wants and what's in benefit for him. And don't uh, let your colleagues say. Mm, maybe this is a good solution. Maybe we can add this as an option. You know, no way. Yeah. That's, so that's you know, let's say you know, be more simple. Mm. I think that's a it's a very good conversation, and uh, the, this is this is the hard point. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Eric. Uh, thank you, Wolfram. from Eric in particular. Thank you so much. You know, it's been an, it's always a privilege to have you, Eric. And uh, you know, your experience is not my age. <laughs> it's still, it's still. Uh, I mean, like that's the wisdom. You know, every, every single word that you said uh, is comes from that forty-five to fifty years of experience that you have. Um, you know, I, I'm sure uh, listeners will will get at least one, if not. 10 pointers that they could actually go and implement not just listen and walk away but actually go and do it for themselves so thank you so much eric for joining so oh. i wish you a family everybody all the good health and happiness and i'm sure you'll see you back again school talk all right thank you for having me basker it's always uh it's always a lot of fun and i enjoy it uh i'm at that point in my career where it's good to be able to give uh, good ideas away to people Totally, Eric. Thank you, Neil. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Wolfram. Thank you for joining as well. <laughs>